The U.S. Consumer Price Index, a key measure of inflation, increased 2.1% over the past 12 months ending in February, up from 1.6% in January, the Bureau of Labor Statistics said. And those numbers were shocking. They represented a substantial acceleration at a time when everyone was already on edge over the prospect of maybe a breakout of real legitimate inflation. Even the bond market sold off on the news of the CPI, triggering a substantial backup in interest rates, at least in the short run. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about today with the release of the January 2024 CPI. This was from March 17th of 2011. What I just read to you was the starting paragraph for a report or an article from CNN. But there are tremendous parallels between now and then, starting with the fact that in 2011, we actually did experience a supply shock. Now, the reason nobody remembers this is because it was, dare I say, transitory. And it was transitory even though the Federal Reserve or central banks around the world really did nothing to stop it. There was no aggressive response to consumer prices that were beginning to accelerate, at least they seemed to, at the start of 2011. Because supply shocks are transitory. They do work out that way. At that time, the supply shock itself, even though consumer price numbers were still going up, we were closer to the end than the beginning of a prolonged period of actual legitimate inflation. The consumer price numbers that were reported today, everyone is talking about as sticky, red hot, another big unexpected increase in the CPI. Although it wasn't really that big, it wasn't that red hot, and it certainly wasn't all that sticky, except for one factor. The CPI continues to be pushed higher by shelter prices. Your interpretation of the latest consumer price numbers depends solely on how you treat the shelter index. Is the shelter representative of an underlying actual economic trend, or is it an artificial imputation that the BLS puts together just so it can spit out what it believes is a representative sample of an urban consumer's experience? The overall number, the month over month rate increase of the CPI was just 0.3%, not a, actually a huge number, but it was better, it was faster than the 0.2% in December, as well as what people were expecting. 3.1% year over year. The core rate, however, that was 0.4% month over month, much higher than people are expecting, cert certainly higher than it should be for a disinflationary period. But that's just, again, shelter prices. Shelter prices are a bigger contributed, contributor to the core rate. For whatever reasons, the BLS believes that shelter prices accelerated in January. They're up 0.6%, much faster than 0.4% in December. But when you exclude those shelter prices, the imputations, owner's equivalent rent, all of that stuff, the BLS actually puts out an index, all items less shelter. And that one was just 0.13% month over month. And it wasn't just January. It was 0.14% month over month in December and 0.01% in November. In fact, going back quite a ways, the all items less shelter index has been thoroughly disinflationary. Over the last year, the year-over-year -year change, just 1.56%. And that's a CPI that's already below the Fed's 2% target. Over the last four months, the all items less shelter index is rising at a 0.7% annual rate. Not 0.7% total, but a 0.7% annual rate. And what all this tells us is that outside of the shelter number, everything looks exactly like a supply shock. And the supply shock, the downside of it means a couple things. As it did in 2011, it might mean recession risks. It also accompany, accompanying it was liquidity problems and a banking crisis that the Federal Reserve was really ultra focused on. And so the Fed, like the public, seemed to be caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one side, they thought, well, this is just a supply shock, so maybe we shouldn't put too much weight on consumer prices. And on the other side, we've got banking liquidity problems and recession. We're going to start with Eric Rosengren, who's the the, the president of the Boston Federal Reserve, at least he was at that time, what he basically said was exactly what I just said. I recognize that recent supply shocks have caused pressures on many household budgets 
and have led some analysts and observers to become concerned about potential long-term inflationary impacts. However, I think the evidence shows that over the past 25 years, most supply shocks have been transitory and have had no lasting imprint on longer-term inflation or on inflation expectations. And he was right. That's the reason why we don't remember 2011, because it did not have any impact on inflation or inflation expectations. Instead, what we remember of 2011 was the banking crisis and recessions around the rest of the world, near recession in the US. Because supply shocks are an imposition. They create these non-productive imbalances throughout the economy that eventually have to be accounted for. In one sense, that's the disinflation, that's the, that's the accounting for the imbalance in prices, but also a lot of times you have to account for the prospect of recession. And that could also mean banking and liquidity, monetary system, financial volatility, all of that stuff too. So as we think about those in the context of 2024, I do want to remind you that next Monday, February 19th, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we at Dollar University will be having a webinar where we talk about one of the biggest single impacted parts of the supply shock in 20, of the 2020s, commercial real estate. What is the real problem here? How big is it? Maybe there's some good news there. And what are the key risks of commercial real estate and then spilling over to banks, the economy, finance, and everything else? There's a link in the description to sign up. I hope to see you there. That's again, next Monday, February 19th. But as we transition from the supply shock that everybody thinks is inflation to the disinflation, maybe recession side, it gets incredibly messy. Back to March of 2011, when CNN was talking about the shocking acceleration in consumer prices, they laid out all of those same concerns that we have today. Rising oil prices have a broad-based effect on the American economy, not just because they shrink the cash in consumers' wallets, but also because they increase production and shipping costs for businesses. As businesses grapple with those costs, they could hold back on hiring for new jobs. But worse, that said, production costs rose 1.6% in February, again, this 2011 alone, the biggest jump in nearly two years. That could mean more broad-based price increases later in the spring, which is exactly what people are talking about today. Costs are going up on things that we tend to buy frequently, this person they quoted said. The key issue now is whether we'll see a more generalized increase. So even though Rosengrid said this is a supply shock that will be transitory, for the rest of 2011, the Fed kept its eye on consumer prices because while they knew it was a supply shock, they were worried it would become embedded in expectations, which is their theory of inflation. Exactly what we hear these days. Even though we see the thorough disinflation, the downside of the supply shock, we see the recession risks, we see recessions around the rest of the world in 2023 and 2024, they still can't help but let go of that theory of consumer prices and inflation. In September of 2011, as the Federal Reserve was wrestling and trying to grapple with the dollar shortage that was plaguing much of the banking system, they also continued to keep their eye on the CPI because CPI numbers were not going down as fast as people would have liked. The September 2011 FOMC meeting, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, Mr. Lockhart said, as regards the assessment of risks, I see the risk to my economic growth projection as elevated and weighted to the downside because that's a recession risk. No change in that assessment from the August meeting when liquidity crisis really erupted in August of 2011. Talked about that several times before. I would add that the risk of financial system instability did intensify in recent weeks because of the European situation, which was a European dollar situation, by the way. In addition, the fact that I and others have repeatedly under forecasted actual inflation, combined with what I'm hearing about the declining ability of firms to offset further cost pressures, leads me to shift inflation risk to the upside. So as he's talking about a supply shock and the recession and all of the liquidity problems in the system, he's also thinking, well, the consumer price numbers haven't come down as fast as we'd like, even though we think this is a supply shock. So now I'm getting more worried about consumer prices. Again, it sounds incredibly familiar. 
Final comment on the balance of risks. The recent behavior of prices has deviated from the earlier projections and, in my view, made the teal book alternative scenario greater, greater supply shock damage more compelling. It seems to me an entirely plausible characterization of the economic environment we now face. And what he was referring to was a set of simulations and projections of what consumer prices in the overall, overall economy would look like if the supply shock from 2009, 2010 into 2011 would not simply just go away, if it had infected and affected consumer price expectations. And what he was saying was that as consumer price numbers kept rising and rising and rising, it seemed to be a more plausible scenario that the supply shock would lead to actual inflation. Again, this sounds incredibly familiar. That's exactly what the Federal Reserve has been concerned about over the last several years. They started out with transitory supply shock and then said, well, maybe this is going to become inflation because it will impact expectations. But as we saw in 2011, the Fed did nothing. They didn't raise rates. They didn't implement any hawkish policies whatsoever. And it became a transitory affair anyway. Eventually, the disinflation showed up. Consumer prices do tend to be sticky. And supply shocks do stick around a little bit longer than you think they should. Lockhart wasn't the only FOMC member who was concerned about inflation becoming actual inflation. After, again, considering the supply shock situation, one other FOMC member, in fact, there were several others, but I'll just quote one here, said, while it's extremely difficult to forecast recessions, I think the deterioration in consumer business sentiment and in the international economic conditions have left us on the cusp of a recession. I still project that the economy will avoid a downturn this year. Remember, this is 2011. But I think that the, the a little extra accommodation would help lower the risk of a downturn. What she's talking about, of course, Operation Twist. Because of all of the downside that was going on at the time, especially liquidity problems, they, they didn't want to do QE3 so soon after ending QE2, so they came up with Operation Twist as, as a way to do something. But that's my point here. The Fed was more accommodating. They were doing more money printing and asset buying at a time when they were also concerned about inflation. And even despite that, what happened to consumer prices? consumer prices eventually went to disinflation because it wasn't actually inflation. You don't need the Fed to, to, to disrupt the, the system. You don't need the Fed to intervene at all. A supply shock will take care of itself. In fact, the supply shock, as I keep saying, was indeed taking care of the situation, which is why there was disinflation as well as recessions around the world. Back to the FOMC. My primary concern about providing more accommodation is the inflation risk. Again, the, the, the theories here. As I mentioned in yesterday's economic go-round, I think it is most likely that inflation will be at or below the rate consistent with price stability in the medium term, but with core inflation measures coming in higher than expected for several months now, including August, there is a risk of underestimating underlying price pressures. And we also have to keep in mind that preceding all of this, the bond market had made a huge move. Rates moved down because the bond market was sensing the longer term as well as short run fallout from these supply shock downsides. And it was more than that. There was, there was obviously more monetary risk. There's collateral shortage and everything. The lingering impacts or lingering aftershocks from the great recession as well as the global not financial not the global not financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, but the supply shock simply made everything and amplified all of the risks, not toward inflation, but the opposite. But again, despite the fact the Fed was accommodating the economy, zero interest rates, operation twist, QEs one and two, not all that far in the past, all that money printing, consumer prices, even though the core rate was continuing to be a problem throughout 2011 and into early months of 2012, it didn't lead to restarted inflation at all. That was never really a possibility. Instead, what she was talking about is with the core rates continuing to rise, it's just the stickiness of consumer prices in some in those situations where the imbalances are substantial. And they were substantial, 2010 and 2011. They were more substantial in 2020 and 2021, which is why the, the period of time it's taking for the supply shock to work itself out appears to be that much longer. 
But as I said, in the latest consumer price numbers, outside of shelter, everything was incredibly, thoroughly disinflationary, which means we should be paying much more attention, like I believe the Federal Reserve is, toward the downside risks. What I just read to you from the 2011 transcripts is what they never tell you in public. Do you remember them talking about recession risks in 2011? Because I sure don't, because they never do. What they talk about in private is not at all what they say in public. So they talk about we're worried about inflation, but they're also more realistically worried about what's happening and the downside to the economy at the end of a supply shock because this remains a supply shock. In the 2011 case, the core inflation rate, the core CPI rate, wouldn't peak until April of 2012. And even then, it got up to 2.31%. So in the subsequent discussions of monetary policies or Federal Reserve policy, not really monetary policies, they kept their eye on core prices and they kept worrying about core prices as well as the potential for too much accommodation. We're doing Operation Twist. But eventually, once core prices and consumer prices in general calmed down, as they were going to, then the Fed really started talking about, hey, maybe we actually need to do more QE because the economy, the monetary situation, the banking situation didn't really get all that much better in 2012 from 2011. That didn't go away. The, the second euro dollar crisis or euro dollar number two actually outlasted the supply shock, even though both were prolonged processes. It was actually the liquidity problem that went on far longer and made much more of an impact than the supply shock on consumer prices. But if you live through that period and you remember 2010 and 2011, the cost of paper, remember that? Um, restaurants were restricting the amount of napkins you could have because costs seemed to be getting out of control. And everybody attributed it to money printing by the Fed. The 2011 case, long forgotten now, but it shouldn't be, established what happens in a supply shock period. You don't need the central bank to come in because the supply shock is always transitory and even the Federal Reserve people know that. There was no red hot CPI for January 2024. Instead, we see the disinflation that we associate with the downside of the supply shock. If you believe the shelter number is a, a legitimate real number, then that's the only part of the bucket that's making any real noise here. If, however, you look at that as just another artificial calculation catching up to where everything had been over the last couple of years, then you're more concerned about the downside part of the supply shock than not because it continues to develop. And not just the United States, but around the re more so around the rest of the world. Similarities are there. They're not perfect, and it's not an exact replay of 2011, but we have all of the same ingredients, consumer prices that were somewhat sticky. We've got banking irregularities, monetary problems, recession risks, all of it. And in the end, no inflation. Just a reminder, next Monday, February 19th, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, webinar, commercial real estate, Talk about the big imbalances of the supply shock. This might be the biggest one. Also, the one facing the greatest downside. There's a link in the description. Sign up for the next Monday's webinar. I hope to see you there. And until next time, take care.